Well, the preacher can often be fairly and unfairly criticised for being irrelevant to their regular congregations. Their critics say that the preacher's sermons can often be heavily theological without being very practical. So they may be speaking about, uh, about God and about heaven and they never get round to applying it to those who are in front of them. That's the criticism, whether fair or unfair. And whether this is true of the ordinary preacher, whether this is true even of me, it certainly was never true of the Lord Jesus Christ. He spoke very clearly about heavenly realities, about the kingdom of God, about eternal life. But he always brought it down to earth. We see this very plainly as we turn to Luke chapter 16 verses 1 to 13 as we hear Jesus telling a parable about the dishonest manager. And this is a parable all about how Christians should be should steward their earthly wealth if they are to have heavenly gain. And so this is all about money. And so I don't think there's a subject that perhaps is more relevant to us than that. So today we're going to look at this parable by considering two things. We're going to first consider the meaning of the parable. We're going to look at this and make sure we understand it. And then we're going to look at the message of the parable. What does it mean for us here in Dunstable in 2024? So firstly, let's consider the meaning of the parable in verses 1 to 8. Now, for those who haven't been with us from the beginning, when we started uh, Luke's Gospel uh, months ago, when we were, we, we were introduced to it right back in chapter 1, uh, around perhaps six to eight months ago now, uh, let me just briefly catch you up. Luke was a real person, and he, uh, though a real person was not one of the original disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't, for himself, see Jesus' life, death and resurrection. Uh, But he had been contracted by a wealthy Roman official named Theophilus to compile a historic account of the life of Jesus. Why Luke? Well, Luke uh, had become a Christian Uh, from a Gentile background, from a a background that was non-Jewish, and he had uh, even began to travel with the Apostle Paul, the uh, early Christian ministry to, uh, to the known world. And he had seen incredible things happening. He had heard all about the life of Christ, and he would have... uh, He would even have met many of the uh, apostles who were remaining alive when he was uh, when when he was travelling with Paul, and so he was able to uh, collate to to compile this extraordinary book that we've been studying with with, uh, eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, teachings, miracles, death, and then resurrection. He began. Uh, by recording the extraordinary birth and childhood of Jesus up to the age of 12. He doesn't tell us what happened in between, uh, between 12 and 30, but he, he, he then moves on to record the various miracles and teachings of Christ and, and especially focuses on the fact that Jesus had not primarily come to teach, he had not primarily come to, uh, to, to, to do miracles, but primarily he had come on a mission to go to Jerusalem where he would be rejected by uh, his own people and would indeed be put on a cross where he would suffer and die for the sins of his people but then would gloriously rise from the dead conquering the grave on the third day. And and Luke has been, uh, it might not feel like he's been rushing but he really has been rushing uh, to tell us all about the events of that last week in Jerusalem. And and as we come to Luke chapter 16, we're we're not quite there yet. Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. He has left the northern part of 
Israel and he is right there on the border of Jerusalem. He's about to enter, but before he does, he tells his disciples a, a number of parables. Rex Andrews dealt with the last parable we were looking at uh, some weeks ago uh, as he looked at Luke chapter 15 and spoke about the, the prodigal son. Well, Jesus is still telling these parables. And this week, uh, we're looking at this parable of the dishonest manager. So let's consider the meaning of this parable. Uh, and I want you to see just three things. And perhaps we could break this up as in three ways. Firstly, we see there's a discovery. Look at verses 1 to 2. He also said to the, to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. So here is a wealthy man, Jesus says, and this wealthy man clearly owns some land. And on this land, he allows tenants to come and rent and they as long as they work the land and as long as they give a proportion of their proceeds to the wealthy man to the landlord they are able to stay there and live there uh, with their families for generations to come but in order to facilitate all of this the wealthy landowner has employed a manager and this manager is responsible for overseeing the land and overseeing with the, the farmers, making sure they're paying their rent on time and making sure that rent is correct. However, one day, Jesus says, the owner discovered that his manager, rather than uh, using the, his responsibilities appropriately, was wasting the owner's wealth. Just as the prodigal son in the previous parable uh, went, uh, took his father's inheritance and moved off to a far distant country and wasted his inheritance, so we now have another person who is wasting uh, the, the, the landowner's money, his wealth. And, and the, the gossip mill begins. The tenants are talking to each other. And eventually this, this rumour reaches all the way to the landlord and the landlord calls in his manager tells him to turn in the accounts and promptly fires him but then we see a decision verse three to seven a decision because now this unemployed manager begins to wonder what am i going to do uh, what will my future have in store for me i've just lost my job I've only got a certain amount of days before I'm, I'm out of here. What does my future hold? And so he begins to weigh it up. Look at verses 3 uh, to, to 5. Uh, and the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. So you see what he's saying? He said, I, I, I can't do manual labour anymore. I'm, 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 I just... You know, I've got soft hands, uh, I've got a, a weak back, I just, I can't go and dig, I can't join the other tenants. It sounds a little bit like an excuse to me, but he, he's, I can't do it. But nor am I going to go, I'm not so desperate that I want to go out on the streets and beg for my living. So what should I do? Well, he decides to use his time wisely. He does this, look at verse 4. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. So you see what he's doing? He says, okay, I've got so long before I'm kicked off my, the, the, the owner's land. Um, but while I still have charge of his accounts, I'm going to call in the tenants one by one, and I'm going to settle their debts. 
So in comes number, that tenant number one. He says, okay, how much do you owe? And it seems that it was customary at that time that they would, they, they, as they uh, worked the land, they would keep their own accounts and they would know how much they owed. In fact, it's, it's kind of like what we do um, with the tax revenue. We uh, compare how much we owe, particularly those of you who are self-employed, and you send it off and you tell them this is how much we owe. And so he says, okay, just write that out and uh, tell me how much you owe. And then he says, I tell you what, you need my signature to confirm that this is right. You reduce it and I'll sign it and you're, it'll all be good. Do you see? What is he doing? Well, he's making friends. He's making friends is what he's doing. I know in a moment I'm going to be homeless. So if I reduce your debt to the landowner, when I'm homeless, I can come knocking on your door and you owe me a favour. It seems to us, and I'm sure as this, this parable is as difficult for some of us as it is for some of the commentators, that here is a man who is described as doing something that is immoral in many ways. He's wasted his master's possessions. He's, uh, he's dealing fairly uh, crookedly, fiddling the books. And we might expect that this man is a bad example to us. After all, we don't expect to find uh, from the mouth of Jesus good examples uh, being immoral men. And yet look at a declaration that's made. Verse (coughs) 8. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. It it should be surprising to us that when the owner realises what has happened, he declares the manager has acted shrewdly. Excuse me, he declares the dishonest manager has acted shrewdly. You see, as the owner looked at what this man had done, he realises two things. He realises that, first of all, this is irreversible. It's irreversible because imagine what would happen if you're one of the tenants and the landowner, after you've had a reduced fee that has been signed off by the manager that the owner employs now comes to you and says, uh, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to disregard that and you're going to have to pay uh, the, what was reduced. How would that make the manager look? It would make him look pretty ungenerous. It would make him look bad. And so he knows he can't go back to the tenants and, and correct it because the manager has made this landowner, this landlord, look more generous, more kind than he actually is. But second, the, manager sees, the owner sees that this manager is, go, is, is going to be able to call on those tenants for help when he's unemployed. He is planned and prepared for his future. Now let me be clear, the owner... And notice this, the owner does not commend the manager for his dishonesty. He doesn't commend him for being immoral. He sacks him for being dishonest. He gets rid of him for being immoral. But he does commend him for his shrewd dealings. He does commend him for the way he does things. 
Now, Jesus, again, is not telling this parable to encourage his disciples to be dishonest in their business affairs. If that's what you take away from this sermon, then let me say on the record, you have heard it completely wrong. He is telling this parable to his disciples to encourage them to deal more shrewdly and less naively with their wealth. You see, it's possible to learn lessons about wisdom from actions that normally we would disagree with. Listen to the Bible commentator Michael Bentley as he illustrates this point for us. He writes, We can admire the skill with which a certain gang of thieves might carry out a cunning robbery, but that does not mean that we applaud them for what they have done. Think of all the uh, documentaries, the true crime documentaries, where the, the sort of who did it, how did they do it, you don't agree with what was done, but you might uh, look at the, uh, 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 and, and, and in some, some strange sense, uh, have an admiration for the planning and the uh, lengths in which they would go to to cover their tracks. We can admire that the dishonest manager planned for his future while disliking and disapproving of how he behaved. That's the meaning of the parable. Here is a, a, a man who has acted shrewdly, and all God's people should act shrewdly with the things that they have been entrusted with, with their wealth. So secondly, let's consider the message of the parable from verses 9 to 13. What lessons can we learn about using our wealth from this dishonest manager in the parable? Well, we don't have to guess, because Jesus, who is the master teacher, draws out three applications for, it for us. So, three applications. First, we should manage our money wisely. We should manage our money wisely. Look at verse 9. I tell you, Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. That's a very clear verse, isn't it? Uh, maybe it takes some explaining. You see, unrighteous wealth, what Jesus is speaking about here, he is drawing a comparison between uh, the, the wealth that the Gentiles seek, which is temporary, which is fleeting, and the wealth that Jesus tells his people to seek, which is treasure in heaven. And so when he's speaking of unrighteous wealth, he is not saying go and get money unrighteously. He is speaking about the world system. He is speaking about the, the wealth that we uh, all need to live in this world, to get on in some way. And so, uh, and, and it, that's in comp contrast to the to having treasure in heaven uh, where moth cannot uh, cannot eat and rust cannot destroy the the manager in this parable he used wealth in order to win friends the manager in this parable did a better job of planning for his future than perhaps many of God's children do. You see, the ungodly often plan better than the Christian for their future, even though they do not believe that there is life after death, even though they do not believe there is a heaven or a hell to come. They plan for their retirement. They plan for, for when they are gone, what will be left to their children often uh, far more carefully and prudently than some of God's people do. And yet we, we need to learn the lesson that we are a people who do not just simply live in the moment, but we live with an eye to the future. We, we live not, not, in, not to a temporary future, but to an eternal future. And if we are planning for going to heaven then how would that shape the way we use our money? How would, that, how would that affect the way we use our money? Well, 
rather than spending it on, uh, on temporary things, investing in things that simply bring us a, a, a little bit of enjoyment and a little bit of comfort for a little bit of time, we will begin to invest it in the kingdom of God. And so, so that when we uh, come to, when, when our wealth fails us, and, and we, we do know that we cannot keep our wealth forever, we will either be able to, even if we keep it in a bank account, uh, and, to, and, and invest it wisely for the end of our lives, we do realise that that money will fail us in the end because it cannot save us from death and we cannot take it with us. And so we need a friend that is not a temporary friend but an eternal friend. Surely Jesus is speaking here of the one who receives us into eternal dwellings, the friend who receives us when, when our money fails as being God himself, the eternal God. So I wonder, how does being a friend of God, knowing that he has given you as a free gift through his son, Jesus Christ, eternal life, shape the way you use your finances? Are you spending it all on, on, on temporary things that just bring you a little bit of comfort, as I said, uh, uh, for a little bit of time, or are you investing it in the kingdom of God? Are you using it generously, giving a proportion of your income to missionary efforts, efforts uh, for the gospel that will last for generations to come? and that will be celebrated in heaven. Believer, for those of you who do regularly give to missions, and perhaps to places that you have never dreamed of visiting, places that are so remote, think of this. You may never see that money again but you may meet those who had someone financed to take the gospel to them in heaven, saying, had you not given, I would not have heard the gospel and I would not be here. Welcome. Welcome into your Father's kingdom. Or giving, dare I say, I know I'm the pastor and I know this is uncomfortable, but giving an income uh, giving a poor proportion of income to the church? Do you regularly tithe? Do you regularly uh, support the ministry of this church uh, by committing to a certain, a certain amount each month or each time your salary comes into your bank account? That, the, that, the, that this church, over 300 years old, may remain for decades to come unless the Lord returns first. We should manage our money wisely. We should also manage our money faithfully. See, if that was the, the, the thing we should learn in comparison to the dishonest manager or the shrewd manager, whichever one you want to call him, we now have two points of contrast. Look at verse 10 to 12. This is what the manager was not. The manager was wise in the way he went about things, about his future, about what he would invest in. But he was not faithful. Verse 10, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? The manager, though teaching us to be wise with our wealth, also teaches us to be faithful, which he was not. He was unfaithful to his master in every way, wasting his possessions, and this resulted in his unemployment. 
But in contrast, the Christian must be faithful over the resources that God has entrusted to them. See, in this, this parable, we may be able to equate this landowner to, to, to God, who is crea- creator of heaven and earth and everything that fills them. He has given us everything we have. There is nothing that you, you have in your possession that was not a gift from God himself. And so we must be faithful if we love him, if we follow him, if we've been saved by him. We must, uh, we, we, we'll want to use everything we have to serve him. Everything we have for his glory. Wanting to be faithful over, over it. And, we, it and, and this doesn't matter if you have a, a lot or if you have a little. In fact, the principle there, we find that principle from the Lord Jesus Christ. That the one who is faithful in very little is faithful in much. But the one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. One of the qualifications, the biblical qualifications for a church elder is that he must manage his own household well. And the reason, Paul says, because if he is not faithful in his home, then how can you expect him to be trusted in the church? (coughs) When we look at uh, church leaders, we expect them to be faithful, not only in the, the affairs of the church, but also in the affairs of the home. But every Christian ought to be faithful in the little things. If you want to be faithful in the big things, if you want great responsibilities in the church, if you want to serve the Lord, then why not start with the small things? Be sure that you're faithful in those those things that no one else notices, that no one else knows about. Be faithful in, in just those things that you feel are in, you, you, you sometimes consider to be insignificant. And perhaps the Lord will entrust you with much. I'll tell a story that I heard from uh, our previous pastor, Barry King, when he was in the United States. He remembers being called out by some church members to their home and they asked him if he would pray for them. And of course, Barry was happy to pray with anyone who asks. And he asked what they might want him to pray for them. And they said, we, 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 we need the Lord to provide us with a greater inc- income. And Barry said, you know how he was, a shake of the head. I can't do that. And they said, well, wh- well why, why is that? And he said, I'm looking around your home and I'm looking at the things you spent your money on and I've listened to where your money goes and I feel if I prayed that prayer, the Lord wouldn't give you anything because you're not using the finances and the resources that God has given you now in a wise way. So why would he give you more to spend foolishly. It's an important lesson for us. Are we using the resources God has given us faithfully? Or is it just, it's mine, I'll use it however I want. Maybe even now your back's up a little bit that the pastor on his first Sunday back in a month uh, is, to, is preaching about money and finances and he doesn't really know, he has no idea what my situation is and you're right, I don't. But I know whether you have a little or whether you have a lot, you're able to use it, not for selfish and sinful means, but for the glory of God and for the advancement of his kingdom. Because after all, it was his money to begin with. Perhaps for some of us, and I'm perhaps going to labour this and ruffle some feathers, but, well, I'm in this deep anyway. So uh, perhaps some of us who don't tithe on a regular basis, and you say, well, how much should I give? And the Bible says, well, 
a good principle is from the Old Testament, it's just 10%. You go, well, I'm not sure I can give 10%. That's a bit much, it's a bit steep. Just remember where your resources came from. It came from Almighty God. And he only asks for 10%. He lets you keep 90 Just think about that. We should manage our money wisely. We should manage our money faithfully. But thirdly, we should manage our money righteously. Most Christians in history and across the world today do not fall into the wealthy and prosperous camp. Most Christians in history have not been wealthy. Most Christians around the world today are not wealthy. Yet the Bible never forbids believers from having riches, from being wealthy. In fact, there are examples of wealthy Christians. In fact, um, we would not have Luke's Gospel if it were not for a wealthy Christian who chose to use his money well. Theophilus who paid Luke to compile the gospel that, that we've been studying over these months. Or think of the, the, the uh, Roman official who the Jews commended in Luke's gospel for building a synagogue so that the people would have somewhere to worship in their town. He was commended by the people and he was a believer. Or we go to the book of Acts, which is the second book that Luke wrote. And there he tells us about someone called Lydia. Lydia, who was a, a seller of purple and uh, who, who had a, a, a house that was large enough for the church to gather in on a regular basis so that they could have their services. You see, the Lord, is, the Lord is, is, does not command people to, uh, to, uh, to, to live in poverty. However, the scriptures do warn us not to fall in love with money. And they warn us not to become slaves of money. We should not be mastered by money, but we should master money and use it as a tool in the service of God. We need to manage our money righteously. That means keeping money in the right place in our lives. Look what Jesus says, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You, he says this to his disciples, you cannot serve God and money. You see, there's nothing wrong with having money. What's wrong is when we make money into an idol and we live for money and we want more money and we're never satisfied until we have lots of money and even then we're not satisfied because we want even more. And, and it, it no longer gives us uh, the pleasure we had hoped for. It no longer gives us the security we longed for but it actually uh, get, creates within us, it causes us to be a slave. It causes us to be indebted to it. That we are never happy unless we've got more coming in. Just look at the rich and powerful and see how how unrestful they are. It's Jim Carrey. uh, We've quoted it in previous weeks. You know, he was um, in the 90s. He rose to fame uh, in Hollywood and became the highest paying actor at that time. And he wrote uh, in, in, I think it was his autobiography at the time, or one of his memoirs, uh, that he wished that everyone could get rich and famous so that they would realise that is not the answer. It didn't bring him happiness, it didn't bring him peace. So how do we do this? How do we keep money in the right place? Well, we need to remember the Gospel. 
we need to always remember that money, material resources, does not save us. It will, it will ultimately not bring us the security and peace that we actually long for. It will not give us the rest that we, we, we hoped it would. Because it's powerless to do that. It fails us. But we have a saviour who does not fail us. We have someone who can bring us security, peace and rest in a way that silver and gold can never do. So God did not send you a million pounds. Why? Because that's just not what you need. He sent his one and only son, the most precious thing he had, who, get, uh, who laid down his life on the cross for our sin. He paid the debt that we owed. We owed, uh, we, we, we owed God uh, because of our sin. And yet Jesus came and he shed his own precious blood, taking the punishment that we deserve in our place on the cross. On the cross, what did he say? It is finished. Or in other words, it has been paid. What has been paid? Your debt of sin that you owe towards God, that you cannot pay for yourself, it will take you an eternity in hell. But Jesus paid it as he hung on that cross of shame. As he experienced the judgment of God falling on him, as he bore our sin in his body, and where sin was condemned in his flesh. He has done what you cannot do, what I cannot do. He has come to save. And because he rose on the third day, and because he lives in heaven today, we can each come to him, telling him uh, how much we owe, telling him our debt of sin, and he will wipe the record clean. He won't take 20% off. He won't take 50% off. He will remove it all. So what are you waiting for? If you haven't come to him. You see, you cannot pay your way into the kingdom of God. You must simply believe and receive the Saviour. Praying to him, asking him to forgive you of your sins, to come into your life, and to then live for him as Lord. Do this today, and you will have an eternal friend who is ready to welcome you into his heaven when everything else fails. Amen.